What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of Dispersing the Cloud. I'm going to shut the car off and get less noise. Um, so, uh, this is actually only the second one that I've done in, in a car and I'm on the road right now, so this is kind of awesome. Um, weekly review, uh, hub shoot. Again, uh, if you watched last week's episode, you know that I'm a week behind, so uh, this isn't for the week that we just went through. It's for the week before that um, and I'll probably do uh, the next one either tomorrow or Tuesday again uh, traveling right now so I'm kind of tied up with time so we had a hub shoot um, that was the end of a uh, four-day shoot uh, production out in San Jose and then I had uh, Amory um, Amory guy she does art department stuff I did art department work for her um, I think that was like a Thursday and then Friday I worked for this production company quite often called Natropic and um, the lady one of the ladies who works for Natropic um, did a branch off thing and she had her own deal so she called me up and I did something for her so production work's been crazy this month I think I've done like eight different productions um, which is a really good month for me um, let's see if I can keep this thing on keep that on I got my notes over here on my iPad uh, we had a music video set up uh, that didn't go through just time crunch. Uh, I had so many different productions that I was running that weren't mine. Then we had some issues with extras, getting enough people out. Um, and then finally, um, that was really just it. I had time crunch and extras and it felt forced and my budget was small and I just got a big, ah, I better just pump the brakes, hold off. That means that I'm probably not going to get to release the Sweet the Sound video in December, but it is what it is um, next year, I guess. And that's probably one of the downsides to um, to doing all this by myself is when I'm on gigs, I don't have anybody to keep other projects rolling. Um, if I'm doing a production gig, my day is literally just tied up. So... <clears throat> um, the process for this week, or the week I'm referring to, uh, I have three different things. Drive, speed, and tension. Um, drive is one of those things that I posted a video on it actually today. Um, one of the guys I follow, Gary V, um, he said, how do you, someone asked him, how do you stay driven? And he said, are you kidding me? Like, you won the lotto, you're a human being. You know what the odds are of you being a human being? You know how many, <clears throat> like, you, you know how many sperm are actually running towards an egg? And it's you. You won the lotto. And you're not jazzed? You're not trying to, to freaking take over? Like, I, I don't know. You suck. You're not driven. I don't know what to tell you. You should be jazzed up every single day because you're alive. Just for the very fact that you're alive, you should be stoked. Um, I have found that getting people to be driven is a very difficult thing, but it shouldn't be. Um, especially people that that work um, not necessarily directly with me, um, sometimes directly with me. Um, it's tough to get them as jazzed up about doing, you know, um, about trying to achieve as I am. I don't know why I inherently have motivation, I inherently have passion, I inherently have drive, but um, I do. The second thing is speed. The speed in which I want to operate doesn't always fly with other people. Um, people that I do work directly with, um, people that I work with when I do productions, <clears throat> I'm doing four or five projects at a time and my speed is very, very quick. Um, with how fast I want to get things accomplished. Um, and if it was just one project, I don't think, um, I actually think my speed might be normal um, when you spread it out among like five to seven projects. If it was just one project, my speed would be even more insane than it is now and it would inherently and cause tension. That's my last thing, tension. Because my drive is high, because my speed is high, the people that I work with, it creates tension. Um, sometimes I can come off as nagging. Sometimes I can come off as um, pushy. 
or micromanaging or all the above. Um, but the problem is, I know there's plenty of time because I'm only 32, and that's uh, quoting Gary Vanderchuk. But I'm I'm hungry. Like I'm busy. I have things to do. I have a whole world to take over, and I don't got a week to wait for you to call me back. I just don't have it. Um, I got a day. I got two days tops, but then I'm going to call you again. And if that makes me crazy, I don't know. Um, so drive speed sometimes creates tension. I think as I make a move, um, as I make a move over into a little bit of normalcy in this next year, as we take on a full-time job and continue doing the things that I'm doing, um, I think speed is going to be incredibly important because I'm going to be tied up almost every single day. I mean, every single day. I'm going to be working 40 hours a week. Uh, luckily, there's 80 work hours in a week, um, so I'll still have plenty of time to do the things that I need to do. But um, I, I, know that that, uh, I know that that drive, the speed, creates tension. I'm looking forward to not having that tension in a normal work setting. When you're doing your own projects, it feels like everybody falls back on their normal job and they they don't have the same intensity that they have in their normal job that they would with a side project. My side projects are my normal job. So I have that same intensity. And I think that's probably, I'm really, I mean, as I'm talking, I'm realizing that now that's probably what it is. Um, so that was the process for this week. The book of this week um, was Wild at Heart. This is, I think, the third time that I've read Wild at Heart. Second or third. If I haven't read it twice, I've definitely dipped into it twice, and then this is the this is the second maybe full time through. Wild at Heart is by John Eldridge. It is a man. It is a man's book. It's dedicated to men, on men. Uh, every man should read this book. Every spiritual man should definitely read this book. Every woman should read this book to help understand men and what we go through and um, how our brains work. And every spiritual woman or wife should read this book to understand her husband. Um, one of uh, one of the few books that I can say changed my life. So I'm just going to go through like I do and do some quotes and then talk about them. Uh, you have to choose God not just once, over and over and over again. Um, choosing God is not a one-time deal. You don't just say, oh, I'm a Christian now. Like, he, like the one thing that Christ promised us was suffering and so we continually have to keep choosing God, which kind of sucks, uh, because you want to like, hey, I chose God, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Uh, things are going to get harder. I had a mentor who used to tell me, um, no one cares about a pawn. When you're a pawn, like if, if this world really is spiritual warfare, and you're a pawn, like you haven't picked a side, no one's bugging you, right? But as soon as you pick a side and say, man, I'm a Christ follower, I'm going to do this, if there is a God and if there is a devil, what's he going to be? He's going to be, oh, all right, now I'm not going to bother you now that you chose size. No, now you're the enemy. Now you're going to get picked on. Um, so it seems like when you choose to follow Christ, you end up hitting more trials and more adversities. And God is someone that you have to choose over and over and over again. Um, and then the next quote is, your journey will cost you. Um, this book talks about... Um, men seeking adventure and men needing adventure the problem what comes with adventure is is cost it costs an adventure you lose something think about every fairy tale that you ever watched every um disney movie you ever ever saw what does it start with it starts with tragedy it doesn't start with sunshine and rainbows there's uh, look at the hobbit look at the matrix there is something horribly wrong with the universe and um or with your story, and that starts your adventure, but your adventure, your journey is going to cost you. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. This is actually a quote from the Bible, Matthew 11, verse 12. This is an awesome quote, because we see, we see Jesus as very meek, right? Uh, this is another great book, uh, Not a Fan, that you should check out. But Not a Fan talks a lot about Jesus, and um, what is meekness? Meekness is strength restrained. Great power restrained. So when we think about Jesus, we think about this like, oh, look, I'm Jesus. No, Jesus was like this dude, right? He's Think about a big guy. There's a, um, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about uh, there's a 
like a group of people with flames and like pitchforks like they're coming to like get Jesus and he's they're camping out in a cave and they're like hey yo we're here for Jesus I, I don't think they said hey yo but transposing here they said what's up we're here for Jesus he said I am he they're like mm, they cowered a little bit it says they cowered I, I don't think they cowered because they knew he was God I think they maybe cowered because he's a big dude no I think I think we're talking about Jesus and Nazareth and he's like yeah that's that's me what's up what can I do for you? No, no, the, the third time, it was like the prophet. We're talking about the prophet. You know, Jesus, me, he's, he's a prophet. And he's like, yeah, what's up? It's me. This is the same guy who sat down and, and made a whip and tore apart the temple, flipping tables, right? Um, this is the same dude, unassisted, by the way, unassisted. If you've ever seen a Roman cross, a Roman cross, typically you had an attendant to help you. Um, I believe he did have assistance near the end. But this dude's carrying his own cross. His own cross. Right? I'm gonna have to look, now I'm interested. I'm going to look it up to see if he had assistance. But if it was me and I had just been whipped for like a half a day, they're going to have to drag me and the cross up there. I'm going to just die right on the whipping stone. Like, I'm not going to make it. But think about, like, a big dude who's like, I know you whipped me with a cat of nine tails for half a day. Where's the cross at? Oh, I'll drag it up there. I got this. That's insane. Um, so anyway, um, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. The problem with the church today is we got a bunch of nice people hanging out in church. That's a big, big problem for me. Um, one, because meekness is not weakness, right? And being nice has nothing to do with being a Christian. Again, Christ flipped over tables and tore apart the temple when it was being disrespected. Now, I'm not saying you should go punch people who disrespect you. But what I am saying is you shouldn't be just a nice person. No one... And, no one wants to be around just a nice guy. No one wants to hang out with you. Um, that's just how it is. And, and I don't um, I don't know, but I don't know how to explain that, but I know that that's not how God created us. Um, I'm getting a text message. Um, you cannot, and this comes right from it too, uh, you cannot turn a cheek you do not have. That's the number one verse that people jump to. The Bible says, turn the other cheek. Yeah, you do turn the other cheek when you're meek, right? Meekness is what? Great strength restrained. So if you're just a nice guy and you've never double-legged somebody into a wall, you've never punched somebody, you've never choked anybody out, you've never gotten to a shouting match and gotten someone's face and got them to back down, how are you going to turn a cheek? You don't have a cheek. There's, oh, you know, he punched me and I turned the other cheek. You didn't, the first one was a turn. Um, I love this book, it gets me freaking jazzed up. You cannot turn a cheek you don't have. Um, the core of a man's heart is undomesticated. It is undomesticated. The core of our heart is wild. That's who we are. Um, three years ago now, I went into the wilderness after reading this book. Went into the wilderness with my brother and said, you know what, man? I'm not going to work. I'm not going back to work. Why? Because I'm freaking wild and I'm growing a beard. Why? Screw it. Because no one can tell me what to do and no one runs my wife. Uh, my wife. I don't have a wife. My life. Um, I'm wild. I'm, I'm just, it's in me. It felt so right after reading this. I was like, yeah. I don't want to live by this nice little comfortable settle down, let's start a family right now and uh, live in suburbia deal. I got nothing against starting a family and I got nothing against settling down um, when it comes to settling down meaning buy a house, but I'm never going to settle down. Um, I'm wild. Um, and I think all men inside of us, that's why men go through um, midlife crisis because they've um, been put into cages. That's another, um, that's another quote coming up. But we put men into cages, right? And we make them go to church and we make them be nice. And then women wonder why the fire has left their marriage. Why there's no more passion. Because you took somebody with a wild heart and you've caged them. They're like the lion with the eyes that have glassed over. There is no more life inside of them. Uh, the next quote that we'll jump to is, How can a man know he is one when his highest aim 
is minding his manners. When I grew up in church, and a lot of churches I go to now, that's our highest aim in church. Mind your manners. You know, be polite. Be a nice guy. That's my highest aim. And I'm supposed to feel masculine about that? Um, I had an awesome workout today where I beat the crap out of a heavy, heavy bag. And um, I'm bummed I haven't got to spar in like, it's been six months, maybe even like eight months since I've actually sparred um, or even wrestled. It's been probably four months since I've wrestled. There's something about that. Um, we can't be nice. There's something about picking somebody up and slamming them against the wall. It, it, it builds us up. It lets us know that we are strong. Um, it talks about a little boy builds castles, right? For his mom look mom I built the castle as soon as dad walks in he goes dad check it out boom kicks over the castle ah I gotta let my dad know that I'm strong it's ingrained in us from a very young age uh, next quote desire that's uh, that are written on every man's heart these are uh, three different desires that are written on every single man's heart and I believe this to the bottom of my core one a battle to fight we need something to be fighting for. We need a cause greater than ourselves, greater than work, greater than the nine to five, or we will straight die. Um, not physically, but just like I said, wives are upset. There's no passion in their marriage. Well, you, you're enslaved to a job and there is nothing to fight for. Um, an adventure to live. Again, <clears throat> we've trapped ourselves in suburbia. You need to read a book called Tribe. Is an amazing book uh, talking about how we've um, secluded ourselves into houses and we have no human interaction anymore and we were built to be communal. We were built to be tribal. That's not to say let's go live in a socialist society. I'm saying that there is something about human um, contact and, and having an adventure and, um, and needing that. And the third thing is a beauty to rescue. Um, these are things that are inherently written on a man's heart. There is something about each thing that I think God placed there for us. Um, something about this, I don't believe that this quote is in here. I don't think I wrote it down, but it's one that always sticks with me. This is something about um, dating, and I technically don't date right now. Um, I do here and there, but n not traditionally sense of like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to find someone. Um, a man goes to a woman to give her his strength, not to receive it. Um, that's part of actually Project Double Down right now. Like, <clears throat> as far as dating goes, I can't do it properly because <clears throat> I'm still trying to build a foundation for my adventure. Right? I'm not. I can't invite someone into that and um, and bring someone along because there's nothing to invite them to yet. Um, that was um, again perfect timing for this week, um, and it was just a, a good quote that should be in there. I don't know if it made it in. Are we willing to live a life that revolves around risk? Um, same author, John Eldred says, life is rigged to only work when we live with risk as one of the themes of our lives. Um, this is something that I have, since I read this book, have grabbed onto and um, literally thrown caution to the wind in almost everything that I do. Um, other than praying about it and um, making sure it's a decision that I can make, right? Making sure that it is a, um, a proper decision. Other than that, I'm flying by the seat of my pants, and I freaking love it. I talked about it last week's video. you got to be malleable. You have to be able to jump from one thing to another. The economy moves so quickly, and technology moves so quickly. You can't get in a rut of, I'm going to do this 100%. This is what I'm going to do. Well, if the market changes, what are you going to do? You gotta, you gotta go to something else. I was talking to one of my, uh, one of my mentor's kids, one of my buddies, Connor the Masters. If you're watching, Connor, what's up? He said, <clears throat> he said, man, you never, you never know what you're doing. I said, I can't know what I'm doing. What if I told you 100% we're gonna go to? There's a gas station over here. I'm gonna meet you at this gas station right here, 100%. Two days from now. Well, if the gas station blows up and burns down. I can't meet you there, so plans would have to change, right? I would have to be flexible. Um, that's a, in an, a very simple analogy for a very complex thing, but I think you get the point. 
This is really awesome. This has to do with people who have wives or have a spouse, um, but wives in particular. Your wife is a helper. And this is, a lot of people get offended by this, like, oh, my wife's not a helper. Like, uh, we're partners in this. And, um, and it doesn't call the man a help, helper. It calls a wife the helper. This is super awesome for wives. So chill out because this is going to get really cool for you. The word helper defined in Hebrew is very difficult to interpret. The only other time this particular word is used in the Bible, the only other time that it's used in the Bible, it is used to describe God helping you. It literally translates life saver. Now the women are like, okay, got it. You're right, I'm a lifesaver. No big deal. Mind blown. Uh, I love that quote. And um, men, your wife is your helper. And if you think you got this handled by yourself, you don't. You need a woman to save your life. Why? Because you're freaking wild, man. You don't need to be put in a cage, but sometimes you need to be steered in a correct direction or woosawed a little bit. And that's okay. You get to be wild at heart, and she can be a little woosaw for you. Um, next quote if you take one verse oh this is awesome if you take one verse from the Bible and hold it above all others you will reach some very interesting conclusions um, I think this was put in there um, just to help us understand I forget what it was about um, it was actually about a specific quote um, in the Bible but I'm I'm not really sure but I like I like that phrase just in general the Bible needs to be taken holistically um, you don't need to uh, look at one. Li this is actually a really good example. Um, the Bible says uh, to turn the other cheek, right? So we're not going to be violent whatsoever. Uh, the Bible also, it actually was about this. It was about this verse. The Bible also says, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and go buy a sword. Jesus said that. Like, freaking Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Then he also said, if you don't have a sword, go sell your clothes and go get yourself a sword. He was totally not okay with killing, but I think he might have understood that if you have a sword, it kind of detours other people from dicking with you. Um, next quote. Why do we put men in cages? We already talked about this. Because they're dangerous. That's why we tell men to chill out. That's why we tell men to just be nice because they're freaking dangerous. Um, have you ever met like an out of control man? Uh, go to college, right? Have you ever met guys before? They're freaking nuts. They need to be put into cages. Um, but that's why we do it. That's why we try to subdue. That's why America has this like huge battle on masculinity of don't be don't be a man's man because that's freaking wild. You need to mind your manners. Um, no, don't mind your manners. Be a little wild because no one will want to hang out with you if you're not. This is huge, and the last three weeks, I've needed this, and this is awesome. Forgiveness is not something you do once; you feel it. Forgiveness is a choice. And the healing comes after. One of the hardest things for me to do is forgive people. Um, especially is when they've hurt you very badly. Um, but, however, I think this verse reigns true. And uh, over this last week, um, reading this book and re refocusing on the things that I need to focus on, it was a very nice reminder that I just need to forgive people and move and move past it and then the healing begins and and you can you can move past it uh, there's an awesome song that says um, when you give forgiveness the prisoner is cap the prisoner is set free basically the prisoner is you though the prisoner is me um, the universe this is awesome the universe is so massive and so endless but the life of one man can only be justified by the measure of his sacrifices. Um, this is just an amazing quote. Um, I, I just love the quote. Uh, another one right along with that. 
notification. Here, another one right along with that is um, is that a man's world is too big to revolve around a woman. When you take your validation, when you take your what makes you a man? That's a good question. What makes you a man? Is it money? Is it fame? Is it a pretty girl on your arm? When you find your validation in those things, you spin out of control when they don't work out. Uh, so the quote that I like is, a man's world is too big to revolve around a woman. It's just too massive. Because if that falls apart, which she's human, she will fail you at some point and it will crush you and break your heart, right? Um, and even if she doesn't fail you, it could be taken away by a tragedy. If your world only revolves around that, and everything is taken from you, and that pulls you, you're going to spin out of control because your world is too big to revolve around that. And so it goes back to the quote uh, in the beginning, men need a battle to fight. We need something larger than ourselves larger than someone to fight for and drive for in this life to find satisfaction, to find joy. Um, that's all the quotes uh, I have for you other than the last one of this book that I'll save to the very end. Um, next week uh, is Waking the Dead again by John Eldridge. Two, um, two Netflix shoots, and again I'm a week behind so that they already happened but I'm going to tell you about them. Two Netflix shoots talk about the road trip that I'm ending right now that I was on this weekend this week um, and um, and recording time at Red Pill Studio and uh, the new song that's going to be released here in the next couple months called Secrets I'm really excited about it um, I'm jazzed so final thoughts for today don't ask yourself what the world needs ask yourself what makes you come alive then go do that because what the world needs is people who come alive. One of my favorite quotes now, um, I've, again, I've heard it before because I've read this a couple times, but this time it spoke to me. I love that quote, and I'm probably going to um, post it all over the place. But thanks for watching, guys. Make sure you follow me on Snapchat because I'm not doing the Twitter posts anymore. Uh, I'm doing Snapchat daily video blogs um, if you want to keep up with dispersing the cloud stuff. Um, obviously, my Instagram is still my Instagram, so I'm on there. And the Facebook keeps you guys up with some of the stuff that I'm doing. But I appreciate the follows. I appreciate you guys watching. And uh, I will talk to you next week in a couple days.